Hello and welcome. Apologize for the slight delay there. A lot of people are uh, still coming on right now. I am Ken Mann, Managing Director at SCNH Capital in the Special Situations Practice, where we raise money for and sell troubled companies in many industries around the country. Um, it's been a, a real honor and a pleasure working with ABI, with Bill Rochelle, and uh, this all-star cast of panelists to put on a three-part series, that, which I think like a good movie and, and its sequels, each of these three sessions will stand alone, but there is interplay between them, and um, you'll get even more out of them if you watch two or three of them rather than just participate today. Uh, but today is session number two, customer involvement in Chapter 11 bankruptcy, assessing their impact on a viable plan or sale. Thanks for joining us. In the interest of time, I'm going to keep my introductions to our panelists very brief and then turn it over to them. Uh, and, and what a panel it is, um, you really should take the time to read their very impressive full bios, which ABI will share in the chat. Uh, I'll start with the Honorable Kevin J. Carey, who needs no introduction. He is a partner in Hogan Lovell's business restructuring and insolvency practice in Philadelphia. And uh, in case you didn't know, he's a retired bankruptcy judge. He also is ABI's immediate past president and represents both companies and creditors in domestic and cross-border bankruptcy proceedings. Judge Carey was first appointed to the U.S. Bankruptcy Court for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania in 2001, then in 2005 began service uh, for the U.S. Bankruptcy Court for the District of Delaware, including serving as chief judge from 2008 through 11. During that time, he authored more than 200 reported decisions, issued important rulings on key issues such as valuation, fiduciary duties, and other complex Chapter 11 and confirmation issues, and presided over high-profile cases such as Exide Technologies, Tribune Company, and New Century Financial. He received his BA in 1976 from Pennsylvania State University and his JD uh, from Villanova University School of Law. Cheryl Toby is a member of Dykema Gossett in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. In both traditional and advanced technology manufacturing, she works closely with purchasing groups and in-house legal, finance, and other business teams to develop effective strategies that address the full spectrum of the supply chain challenges they face daily. As a bankruptcy and restructuring attorney, Ms. Toby has decades of experience as lead counsel in numerous significant bankruptcy cases throughout the country. She's received multiple awards, including being named as one of 38 women in the U.S. to Euromoney's Women in Business Law Expert Guide 2022. She received her BA from Michigan State University and her JD cum laude from Wayne State University. Matthew Wilkins is a co-founder of Brooks Wilkins Sharkey and Turco in Birmingham, Michigan, where he advises customers and suppliers, primarily in the automotive industry, on a wide variety of contract issues and disputes. He has special expertise in the negotiation and documentation of complex supply chain agreements and asset sales where either the customer or the supplier is financially distressed. Mr. Wilkins has a deep background in bankruptcy and creditors' rights in commercial and business litigation and specializes in high-stakes litigation, supply chain counseling, and advising clients in financially distressed situations. He received his BA uh, from Vanderbilt University and his JD from Indiana University School of Law. Uh, our moderator today is supposed to be Mr. Bill Rochelle, ABI's editor at large. Uh, he's having some technical difficulties. Hopefully, he'll join us. Uh, he joined ABI in 2015. As you know, he writes every day on developments in consumer and reorganization law. Uh, for nine years prior to joining ABI, Mr. Rochelle was the bankruptcy columnist for Bloomberg News. Before turning to journalism, he practiced law for 35 years. Um, in addition to writing, Mr. Rochelle travels the country for ABI, speaking to bar groups and professional organizations on hot topics and turnaround and consumer bankruptcy. Um, he, he earned his undergraduate and law degrees from Columbia University. Uh, thank you, panelists, for your generosity and sharing your wisdom with us today. Appreciate your participation. Uh, while we uh, 
wait for Bill, I'll, I'll get us kicked off. The description of the topic that we're going to cover today is the importance of customers as a source of revenue, as committee members, as potential buyers, potential adversaries, um, and whether they are profitable contract counterparties or profitable. And so throwing it out to the group, my question is, you know, who has the leverage? Is it always the customer? Or is it always the debtor? Uh, or does it really depend on the circumstances? So um, I'll throw that out. Maybe Cheryl, you can kick that off for us. Uh, the practical is it depends. And, and each case is different. And like you said, you have the practical and you have the legal. And I think in these situations, the practical really controls as to how the leverage runs and how you can use it. Um, and those have lots of implications, both within, you know, prior to bankruptcy, during bankruptcy, and on an exit, that situation and the relationships kind of change throughout that process um, and how it plays in. So it's it's really a practical, I think, more than a legal in many respects as to who has the leverage. And it changes, whether it's a consumer case, manufacturing case, and obviously just-in-time manufacturing system and dependent on it has implications, um, retail, it really depends on the type of case you have. Yeah, okay. I, I think every 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 case is different, and you know when you're sizing up when you're sizing up leverage, you need to consider you know, can can the customer move easily? Can they can they resource their business? If if they can, how long would that take them? How much might it cost them to do that? Um, if you're going to reject their contract, can you replace their overhead contribution, for example? Um, or you have a situation where the customer could actually be sinking you um, because of an underpriced contract. Um, and I think when you're making making that evaluation, you you kind of want to project ahead and and you know decide are you are you positioning the company for a sale? Are you trying to reorganize the company? Um, if you're going to uh, sell it, can you survive long enough to get to a sale knowing that buyers may very well come in and renegotiate reprice contracts? Um, or if you're going to reorganize, what, what is that going to look like with the customer base that you have? Um, but I think it is critical, as Cheryl noted, to try to get an unvarnished or as unvarnished of you at the outset of a case as you can as to as to where your your customers are and kind of what leverage you have and and you know sometimes you need to look outside of your client um for input as to as to what leverage you have some some Can we talk some, leverage some clients are realistic right. some 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 believe that you know customer can never resource in in you know any any, any well, Matt that's my next question and this is for everyone does the debtor often, or let's say sometimes, um, misapprehend their leverage? Yes. And and when we talk leverage, I mean, the sad thing is a, a company needs its customers to survive. And if you, and a lot of times while blaming and doing things within the bankruptcy to try to get to an immediate goal is starting more often than not now, I think, having long-term implications as to whether that company really survives. So that can impact the sale price as well with sophisticated buyers that know whether that relationship's gonna be damaged, whether they're truly competitive after you buy it and you take it out of bankruptcy and you take care of maybe the immediate problem. If you're not competitive thereafter, you're not gonna get new business you're going to be at a disadvantage. The company's going to fail again. And we see that quite a bit. And I think now more uh, sophisticated buyers, especially in the strategic, that know what the competitive value really is, um, it's starting to have an impact 
on the bankruptcy cases in effect as to whether that company can really be bought, restructured, and continue. So, yeah, look, I agree with both of what, what you've said, um, but to the specific question, do debtors misapprehend? Well, if they're in Chapter 11, it's likely they misapprehended more than one thing um, <laughs> other than leverage with their customers. Uh, but look, you know, it's fairly common if the, the debtor is obligated to, to produce a product at a certain price and it's, it turns out to be too low because market prices ha have gone up. Um, that can affect either way, depending on who wins or loses with the customer or the debtor. So, yeah, the answer to the question is yes. Um, but, you know, the thing about the 11 is there, there's more the voice, there's more than the voice of the debtor and the debtor's counterparty in a contract, uh, assuming it's with the customer. You know, there's a creditors committee, uh, other lenders, perhaps to be whose views must be considered. So, it's not a bilateral decision. So the um, answer is though, yes, they sometimes misapprehend and may come in and say, fine, um, you know, uh, we're going to ask for X amount of price increases. Uh, that's where people tend to focus and might be surprised that they may not have a customer yeah. at all. There may yeah. How how effective is the threat of rejection of, of a customer's contract in the leverage on price negotiations? Well, <laughs> as both Matt and Cheryl have said, it depends on the circumstances, but it can be very effective. Um, you know, the threat of rejection results in renegotiation of all, all kinds of contracts from leases to supply contracts to, um, you know, just pricing. Uh, it really it can have a dramatic um, effect. All right, uh, so that we uh, keep moving here, um, can someone speak to what are the dynamics or differences when you're talking about manufacturing just in time, things that Cheryl mentioned in her opening comments versus say a case that involves commodities or you know a service organization rather than just in time manufacturing? How do those dynamics make, make the strategies different? Well, with with, with just in time, which is which is how the U.S. auto business, for example, is is set up, um, it it gives a debtor a lot of leverage because because often um, parts are sole sourced to a debtor more more often than not. Um, customers are are literally hand to mouth. It may be you know a matter of days worth of of supply. So any any interruption, any interruption at all can potentially be catastrophic for the customers. So that's I mean, that's on that's on one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, if you have if you have parts that are more more commodities or more more commoditized, um, not just in time, your leverage you know, just goes down on a sliding scale. Well, and we you also have to watch what you wish for um, sometimes. So a rejection of contract can mean damages. And that customer can suddenly become uh, your biggest creditor. Uh, that could be a problem for a debtor. Um, and then in the just-in-time, I mean, it's it's our manufacturing systems are going more and more towards that process because for a lot of different reasons. So whether it's aerospace, um, automotive, other types of manufacturing, it's it's more common and knowing how to deal with that becomes critical. But again, it also goes to what you said, Ken, do people sometimes overestimate? Yes, because they don't necessarily know whether there's parts being manufactured overseas, other options that can be addressed whether the customer saw this coming before the debtor did and the potential debtor and maybe dual source, there's all sorts of things that can go on and that could be a big mistake by companies. So look on rejection damage claims, yes, they can be large, but I've yet to meet the creditor who thinks it's a good thing that they're owed a lot of money. <laughs> so um, generally I, th I think counterparties tend not to, if they can help it, um, you know, 
they like to avoid projection of the contract if they can, depending. Look, there's a question I see from the audience, um, which is, if the debtor is manufacturing a key component required by the customer, does the customer need to monitor the debtor's ability? Of course, uh, of course they do. And it may be a situation in which the, the counterparty may move the court to have the contract assumed or rejected early on. So the customer knows just where it stands. With yeah, in, in that same question had a follow-up to it. And yeah, we've all seen where that customer needs the part. And so therefore has to provide some financing or some price concessions, at least on a short-term basis, to ensure that the debtor uh, can survive to, to manufacture the product. Um, as somebody's trying to quickly make decisions about the assumption of an executory contract, uh, the question is, when, if ever, should the debtor seek to quickly assume how much urgency is required? And, and to Judge Carey, how often do you see that? Should it be used more or less as a tool? So I, I didn't see it frequently, but I saw it because lots of times customers are at risk um, uh, posed by the, the question we just addressed uh, about getting a product that they desperately need for their business and without which their business would be materially harmed. Um, you know, if I saw a situation in which a counterparty was required to expend um, sums of money uh, or incur liability as a result of, you know, being in the never, never land of not being assumed or rejected. Uh, that would matter to me. Yeah. Can, can I go back for, to that question for a second too? I, I, on the customer monitoring, I work with a, a lot of customers, obviously, as does a lot of our uh, viewers, but the best customers actually know the supplier is getting in trouble. And I do have customers that know that before the supplier even knows, frankly, because they're monitoring financials. They know what their production requirements are. They know what's coming in, what's going out, et cetera. So they can actually see if you do a good job in that monitoring where the supplier is well before the supplier even knows. And that's where the pre-planning comes. Yeah, I, I would say that's probably depends on the industry but that's probably the exception of the rule um these companies and these buyers are they're super busy they are stretched thin um as it is and and they just often don't have enough resources or time in the day to do the diligence you know the continual dil diligence that they probably should yeah you and judge Carey even suggest but i mean i think all this all this lends itself to you know, when you're when you're considering that relationship and you're in a bankruptcy, you need to have a reasonably healthy dialogue with your customers um, to see if there's an opportunity for, you know, repricing something or whether it's going to get to the actual contract rejection stage. Um, right. No, yeah, customer, no, no customer wants to be caught, you know, flat footed. And that's that's obviously not not a great approach. I'm sorry, Judge Kerry. No, I just I can't remember, Matt, whether you or Cheryl mentioned it, but the, the debtor, the company needs customers. So one of the things a company has to do is make sure it's got sufficient liquidity and make sure it's known to the market and to its customers that it's going to be stable enough to continue in business um, or else customers may tend to, um, especially when they're pelted by communications from the debtor's competitors uh, to take the business away. So it's important for a debtor to to project the right um, image of stability and liquidity uh, so that it can go on, even if it's for a sale process, at least while the process is going on, customers need the assurance that the company can go and buyers want that too, if it uh, turns into a sale case. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a, a really good point and absolutely spot on. And I, I, you know, there, there are ways you can do that, you know, through, through getting, Financing orders in place at the outset, um, critical vendor motions and orders in place to to give your customers the assurance that you know yes you will be in a position to buy the buy the raw materials or components that go into their parts. So I'm an investment banker, so from my point of view, my answer is always you have to keep these customers right. This part of what I'm selling. And, and of course, it's hard to sell money losing business. So let's try to get the contracts profitable, but let's not chase big name customers away. Let's let buyers decide 
how they can make those work. Maybe they have more efficient operations or what have you. And so in talking with you folks prior to, to today, you always mentioned the, the importance of confidence of the customer. How do you get their confidence? Um, so what are some of the ways as you're looking at a case that if you're representing the debtor or the committee, you're seeking to make sure that the customers are confident that the debtor can continue to produce and they don't go and resource um, these contracts elsewhere? Well, I mean, we, we, we yeah, do it with, yeah. with, with 13, like, for example, Ken, um, you or somebody like you can prepare a 13-week cash flow projection, which can, can demonstrate that for that period of time, for those number of months, your client's going to have sufficient resources to produce. Uh, it, it, those often also can show that, you know, there's there's a shortfall that, you know, where, where money is going to need to come from someplace, and, and it may come from the customers, it may come from the lenders, um, but that that's, I mean, that's a way to do it. And as I mentioned a minute ago, um, financing orders can go a long way to, you know, instill confidence in customers, critical vendor orders, um, that's what we do. Yeah, those are all important. I think, though, also acknowledging where mistakes were made, how they're going to be fixed, uh, what the the company is really doing to own the situation. That plays a lot better with customers, frankly, than just coming in hammering. And there's a lot more respect when we say, OK, look, this is what we've done to better. This is what we're planning to do to better confidence in the numbers um, is critical, frankly. Uh, we need to know exactly where this company is, where its losses, et cetera. Um, a lot of them come in and just say pricing. They, they like to just come in and hammer pricing and not take any look at their own operations and how that could have been bettered and reduced costs. Um, when somebody comes in with some of these other types of elements being addressed, you get a lot more respect and a lot more, um, a, a better approach in a cooperative environment. And I agree, Cheryl. That has to do with um, the way I would say it is confidence in management. Management has to project um, the image of being competent and prepared to do the things that you've just described. Right. And and too often we see just the opposite, frankly. And even when the advisors come in sometimes on a financial basis, um, they're very obviously you've got to advocate for your your company, but um really just hammering and blaming everybody and everything else doesn't play well, to be honest. Yeah. And so in that situation where there's a loss of confidence in, in the management. Uh, you know, what's the response to that? If your debtors counsel are consultants, the answer, how do you view that when you represent debtors? Yeah, well, my point on that is, again, the con the consultants have to be realistic as well, because when they get too far behind, when they get behind their management or just continue that mantra, it doesn't help anyone, frankly. So, um, I think there's typically better approaches across the board in how you approach your customers. And it could you be know, a I, new CRO, it could be a new um, board, could be an independent um, board member, could be lots of different governance things uh, that could take place, which would help instill that confidence in customers. Yeah, I yes. like I like I like using quality financial advisors because um, I, I think it does give. I think in most cases it does give customers. A degree of confidence that you know they're hearing they're hearing it straight they're not it's not being filtered through management and customers know that they're they're probably going to see the same financial advisors in the next case and you know financial advisors have to be have to be trusted or or they won't be trusted in the next go round what happens uh in the last couple of minutes here what happens if a customer happens to be of national defense interest, or just as the U.S. government in general, you're making parts for a fighter jet, for example. How does that play in? Well, from the debtor's standpoint, it can be a real pain in the tuchus, uh, because the government at that point really has to say 
about whether it wants to stick with the debtor or not, depending, uh, and it doesn't depend, I think, on, on which interpretation of 365 the particular circuit you're in does in terms of the or or and dispute uh, of whether you can assume and assign. Uh, you know, the government pretty much has a say. I had a I had a provision, I had a case in which the debtor made a part for the M1 Abrams tech, tank. And uh, the debtor kept, the government kept him on because uh, I don't think the government had many choices at that point. So the government can be put at a disadvantage too, uh, even though they have a say over whether they keep a contract with the debtor or not, uh, maybe they'll need the debtor. Yeah, I think, I think, I think, Ken, the answer is it, it's complicated and it's, it's, a little complicated as to whether it's as easy to reject those contracts as as others. Yeah, there's some okay, law. Well, there's some law on both sides of that. Put it that way. Um, we've reached our time at twelve thirty. That, that said, uh, if it's like the last one, some people will be happy to hang on and continue to uh, learn from your wisdom. So, for those of you that need to drop, we appreciate your participation. Uh, hopefully you've got some interesting tidbits and uh, you'll want to learn more about this topic. For those of you that are still hanging on, we'll, we'll answer any questions if you want to post them in the chat. Um, look at that. We have uh, attendance from Nigeria. Thank yeah, you for participating. So yeah. um, and, uh, and while we're waiting to see if there are any other questions, I, I ask each of the panelists, we'll start with Judge Kerry. Um, and then go to Cheryl, and then Matt can wrap it up. What's kind of your one key takeaway, your one critical thing that people have to think about in, in these situations where the customer might be might fill a lot of roles, including becoming a large creditor? Look, um, when I go down the list of what advantages a Chapter 11 proceeding has here in the U.S., it's the debtor's ability to assume or reject. Uh, but as Matt just pointed out, it's not always an uncomplicated situation. It depends, as Cheryl said at the outset, on the particular circumstances involved. But um, some Chapter 11s can actually center around uh, customer relations and contracts uh, and determine whether the business can continue or whether buyers will be interested. But it can be, these issues can be central to an 11. Yes, and again, I, I think the takeaway is be realistic and really figure out what you're trying to drive to. Um, everyone focuses on using that leverage, but in the end, is that really going to get you the viable entity coming out? Will a buyer buy? Uh, don't overplay your hand is really on both sides, frankly, the message that has to Go and you need confidence in financial advisors, management, whoever's really approaching the situation to get to a good end. Yeah, my my, my takeaways would be, and I, I know you asked for one, Kim, but I'll give you four. Um, do your best to understand the leverage position that you have or don't have. Um, have have an informed discussion with your customer, and keep keep the lines of communication open, be credible with your customers, and also be realistic in, in those negotiations. All great advice. And I think those those would be uh, good points to give to the counsel for customers as well, right? Because I've seen the customer that just doesn't want to hear anything. No, we won't give on anything. And they find themselves in a bad spot and they don't help a process. And whereas other customers say, look, I'm just going to be blunt with you. I need this part. I have to pay what it is. Uh, and they have a reasonable conversation without wasting a lot of time on negotiations and get to a solution that gets them to a, a, a new operator that they like and can have confidence in. So Cheryl, I didn't mean to cut you off. Are you going to add something? No, no, I agree with everything that's been said. You're absolutely right. And I think people have to think out of the box uh, a little bit more and more often now. Um, it isn't what's causing the whole, there may be ways to fund it or to negotiate with future buyers in a way that still brings value to the debtor that they're looking for, but also gives a truly viable entity on a go forward basis. 
And that, I think, that message has to come through. Um, I think it's going to come through the hard way soon because buyers are starting to understand that when the leverage is just, when there's just sort of a simple answer given, higher pricing and creating this entity that really doesn't have a viable future, that's a problem. So there's different ways to fill that hole and people have to start thinking more, I think, because we're going to see that impact the industries, I think, on a buy basis. All right. Well, believe it or not, we still have 60 three participants hanging on. So I'll go ahead and, and uh, ask a question that came in on the chat. Is there anything different um, in chapter 11 versus a chapter five when it comes to these issues we're discussing? Well, no, no, no committee as Judge Carey, you know, alluded to earlier, no, no, uh, no creditors committee in sub chapter five. So yes. Um, and, and the sub fives are just, you know, they, they are designed to move faster and less expensively. They don't they don't always work that way, but that's that's really the big difference. When you have a yeah, trustee, hurry up and get your sub five before someone gets uh, rejection damages because you won't qualify thereafter. But go ahead. Well, and you have a trustee whose role is designed largely to try to find a way to get to a consensual plan. Um, so you really don't have a I'll call a neutral in that respect in a in a full 11. Um, so I view that as a probably helpful thing uh, to get more of these cases to confirmation than might otherwise be the case. In the manufacturing world, I can say that a chapter five, a small critical supplier is more difficult to address and can be costlier and more time consuming from an outside advisor standpoint, especially for customers, than a big case sometimes. Because big case, you have, by, you have those professionals that know exactly what to do. There's no emotion tied to it. Um, smaller businesses, that can be very difficult to really fix and address and get to a safe landing for everyone. Um, and it, so that's the tough thing in the chapter fives is and getting people really in reality as to what their options are. I, I have a question for Ken. In in because I you do sales for a living. I guess what what roles do you see kind of bridging the discussions or bridging the gaps between the debtors, your client, I guess usually, and and potential purchasers and also the customers and the customers. Yeah, I think the investment banker ends up almost in a CRO-ish type of role if they want to get a deal done because, you know, they're hearing from the buying audience what's attractive about this business and what's not. Um, and the debtor's voice may be largely ignored by the customers. And so the investment banker has to jump in and talk to the customers and say, look, Here's the pool of buyers. You like some of these. You already do business with them. We can get you to the promised land, but we need some help. I know you don't believe any numbers the debtor gives you, but I'm telling you the buying audience says they can't make this part for less than X. What can we do? And so the investment bankers got to just jump in and try to be the adult in the room, if you will. That's right. Uh, and 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 keep keep the, the customer and the debtor. Uh, at arm's length and and be an independent third party that is just trying to be realistic. We can't get a buyer if we can't solve these problems. So it's interesting. They're enjoyable, but uh, time consuming engagements. I swear that was the word I was, the exact sentence I was going to say, the adult in the room, they can actually add a lot of value in being the really um, thoughtful less attached, reasonable voice, getting the parties to a reality as to what needs to occur. Yeah. Well, uh, we're coming up on 1240. I want to uh, apologize to the audience for being stuck with me. I have no substitute for Bill Rochelle, uh, but uh, thanks to the fantastic panel, all I had to do was read from an outline a few times because I think you guys could talk about this for eight more hours. 
Um, these are the foremost experts I could find on the topic. So if you have follow-up questions, please reach out to these panelists. I'm sure they're happy to, um, to answer some questions and engage in some dialogue. Thanks everybody for attending and for hanging in there with us. And uh, hopefully you'll join us for session number three. You'll see information from ABI. I don't know if uh, Robin's gonna jump on here with some housekeeping about when that third session is, but keep your eyes open for it. You'll see some information about it. Thanks very much, everyone. Have a great day. Good job, Ken, for stepping in for Bill. Sorry, Bill. Thanks.